Hi everyone, morning. Um, so, uh, great to see everyone here today. Um, I'm pretty much going to be talking about, as you see in the, the, the speaker's bio, is just to, or in the topic rather, is just really some of our experiences which we found as a, as a South African startup. Um, the lessons we've learned, and I think it, it's not going to be particularly technical, but the important thing here, I think, is a lot of entrepreneurs in the audience, and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of you are faced with a lot of scaling issues, and I think something important here is just to go through and give us some of the things that we've learned, um, perhaps, some, perhaps some of these lessons uh, which we've gone through you'll identify with. Um, it represents our unique experiences. It's not to say that this answers this, uh, the, the problem of scaling for everyone. Everyone's business is different, their service is different, but we think a large portion of it, I think, does uh, indeed apply to, to a lot of you. <clears throat> The other thing that puts in context is, of course, there are some unique challenges facing a South African startup. There's not an abundance of venture capital. It's quite easy, attract, uh, or typical driver to attract talent. It's quite easy to keep them being poached. So I think it all, all of this, of what I'm going to speak about now, is also seen in a, a particularly South African context. So just give a bit of an introduction into uh, who to go is. We are a mobile social network. We're an application, not a Mobi site. We build applications for feature phones principally. Uh, we're moving more into the smartphone realm at the, at the moment in, with uh, Android and iPhone. And we essentially provide mobile to mobile instant messaging. Um, we, so this incorporates private messaging, one-to-one -one messaging, as well as uh, chat rooms, photo sharing, sharing a friend's contacts. We also do matchups with users so users can communicate with one another. The big benefit here is the reduction of cost and we particularly appeal to an African market. So we're looking at the emerging market, African market and building apps for uh, improving communication for these users. So our principal platform is of course feature phones. Uh, for those of you who might have forgotten what feature phones are, these are the older Nokias, they, your older Samsungs, low amount of memory, small screen, uh, a small resu uh, low resolution on the, the handset, uh, often 2G connectivity, and this provides a very difficult development environment for us. You need to cater for a wide amount of phones, there are uh, intense uh, resource constraints on the handset as you can imagine in order to keep the cost low. There's poor quality networks that uh, these phones will typically connect to. So there's a wide uh, array of challenges on the handset development. I'm going to be speaking largely about the server portion of scaling, but this just sets the tone sort of for the, the industry in which we operate. This is showing to go uh, running on a feature phone. And here's our new Android version, which is uh, about to be launched in the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> so we're particularly proud about that. I know we've got a, a lot of our developers at the back are uh, pretty red eyes and so on. They've been working uh, uh, quite a bit lately on getting this out in time. So as a company, we focus on Africa. We have uh, more than 10 million uh, active users, principally in uh, South Africa and Nigeria. We've had a huge amount of growth in Nigeria over the last uh, 18 months. Uh, 9 million users, as you can see, in Nigeria, 1.5 uh, in South Africa, a uh, smaller amount in Kenya, but pretty much we represent it in every country, but the continent represents our target market. All of the, the uh, efforts that we, we um, put into the company go towards dealing particularly with the difficulties faced on the continent. So this graph just shows uh, pretty much our, uh, just puts things in, into perspective. The company was founded in uh, 2007, and uh, you know, as you can see with many graphs you'll see of uh, social networks, the ramp up is enormous. We have 25, um, uh, over 25 million registered users, 10 million of those are active, and we send about 14 billion messages a month in private, uh, private chats and chat rooms. So just some background on the company, it was founded in 2007 by uh, Ashley, Peter and Alan Wolf, while studying at, uh, at WITS, studying computer science together, decided to tackle the problem of communication on low-end handsets. And I think the important thing is we're a profitable startup with no investment. This is something that we're particularly proud of. I think with a lot of startups often receive quite a bit of money uh, to, to get things going ramped up quite quickly. We've managed to do that with no investment whatsoever. And this, of course, has forced us to make some really smart decisions when it comes to the scaling. We can't afford to be taking on extra resources or providing services which we can't provide for. That means every single decision we make has to be made very carefully and this will feed into the scaling that I go on to. We're just 17 employees 
Uh, we're based in Cape Town, just to give a sense of, of who the team is. Um, here's a couple of the guys. Uh, this was at one of the recent launches. You'll see them in the audience today. But let's get into some of the dirty details of, of scaling from our perspective. So the re why is scaling uh, um, difficult for social networks is might not uh, scaling is sometimes uh, you know means different things inside different organisations. But just to give an example, uh, something we deal with at the moment, we have about 800 logins per second. Now that doesn't sound it's not a massive amount, but the problem is that each of those users has 100 users on their contact list. When a user logs in, that contact list has to appear on the phone. It has to for each of those contacts on the list, it needs to pull a certain amount of information. It needs to pull a name, it needs to pull a status, it needs to pull a profile picture. There's a whole lot of parameters. So of course, suddenly your 800 uh, logins per second is multiplied by 100 in terms of how many objects you need to fetch. Each object might have uh, three, uh, three parameter or three attributes to that. Suddenly you're dealing with 240,000 per second. Each additional, and of course, each additional ad, uh, user added to the network will be adding up to 100 friends. And of course, as you add extra features to the network, you might be adding another parameter to the users or another attribute to the user object that, of course, now scales across your entire network. And you very quickly increase the amount of fetches. It puts enormous load on your networking infrastructure, on your caching, on your databases, and so on. So that's the reason for social networks. Because of that social graph, causes the scaling to be such an intense problem uh, in social networks. So what does scaling mean to, to us as a company? Well, it means servicing growing user demand. And that means, w when I talk about servicing there, I mean providing a service that is responsive and the quality should not be affected by the load. That means that when the, 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 the service that the user gets in the quiet periods should match that which you receive under extreme load. And that's about, it's about servicing that demand. We don't want slow response at peak. And that is essentially what scaling is all about to us. And the way to do that is pretty much in two ways. The one is to removing your bottlenecks. So that's, that is about increasing your efficiency. And the second thing is expanding the service capacity to cater for growing demand. The balancing of these two is quite important, of course, in providing an overall approach to scaling. The important thing that needs to be added here about servicing that growing user demand is, of course, to do this at the right time. And I know a few of us have heard this quite a bit before, but you know, the problem with scaling too early is that your development is slow because you're concentrating on too many things that might perhaps are not uh, contributing to solving a scaling problem. You're buying additional servers which you don't need, you're deploying services which require increasing administration, system administration, and for that reason, don't scale too early, scale at exactly the right time. The other side of that, of course, is scaling too late, you know, customers, fail whales, that sort of thing. We've all seen this happen before. Um, and so the, the important thing here, the, the critical thing, especially for a startup with limited resources, where you can't just expand your capacity indefinitely, is to do this at the right time. Take note of things when things are going wrong, measure your network, uh, have uh, parameters and measurements so that you can see exactly how the performance of things and be able to, to anticipate that and, and scale out the, uh, the, the, the provision of services in accordance with the demand. The other thing there is the, one of the important notes in terms of scaling is a lean approach to production. This deserves a talk all on its own, really. But I think the, the view on lean really takes its, its roots from, uh, from the, the production environment or the, the manufacturing environment. And the, the point here is that any effort expended that does not improve value to a customer is wasteful. That's the only reason to do anything in terms of scaling. It's not for, for fun. It's not for because it's interesting, it's only to service, to increase the value to your customer. Now the thing here is that this all depends because we're in different industries. To some, a customer might be an end user. To others, it might be perhaps an internal department which you're looking to provide increased capacity to. But the, the important thing here, which we like to do, is every time we're discussing something, any capacity increase always needs to take into account, are we doing this for the customer? Is this improving things to the customer? Is it improving things to our internal team? So that takes, there's a, there's a few um, dimensions to improving this value. So that can be exactly as I said, asking the question, how is my time spent? Is what I'm doing at the moment important? Is it critical? Does it improve the value to the customer? In terms of optimizing teams, this is, this is about uh, improving operations, about its configuration of the services, it's optimizing the flow, 
It's the order of work we do in the company. How exactly are we, are we ordering our work correctly, that things are happening at the right time? And then, of course, the arrangement of teams. How are teams arranged? How do they talk to one another? How are they configured? Are the right people working together with the right people? Are they, are they being communicated to adequately? Do they understand the parameters of their problem? But in, with Lean, of course, the, the ultimate objective is in reducing waste. And for those of you who would have read up on uh, a Lean approach in, in, as I say, classical manufacturing environments, it's all about reducing waste, reducing waste in anything you do. Don't deploy unnecessary services. Don't employ or, or don't suddenly find the, um, there might be a, a tendency to want to implement a new framework, the latest language. Let's overhaul our database. Let's all do it from scratch. It might be wasteful. It's not contributing to increasing value for the customer. So when we talk about scaling, how do we see it? Well, well we see it in, in, in two respects, really. It's about scaling of technology, which is maybe the most obvious one, and others, of course, scaling uh, your teams. So I've covered this already, but the scaling the technology is a, the ability to accommodate the growing volume of requests from users. But in terms of teams, it's about growing a talented team that can really solve the hard problems, because that's all it is about, solving the really hard problems. And I think it's a maxim which we've probably all heard before, your first 20 hires are the most important. You need to make sure that every member of that team is completely committed as the capability and as the capacity to grow. So let's look at some uh, approaches uh, to a scaling. And I think one of the things is there's some, there's some uh, important aspects to consider here. Again, the only important consideration is a customer. The second thing is understand the problem. In terms of, in terms of technology, understand the whole stack from your network to your application, to the server, to the components of it. Understand that full production line so that you know when you're faced with a problem you can identify it quite quickly and you can get to that root cause to find exactly where you need to be applying your efforts. And then of course there's the concept of scaling up versus scaling out. Scaling up, in a simple analogy, would be to buy a better server, more RAM, faster processor, uh, spend more money. The other might be to scale out, and that would be to buy more servers, to cluster them, to put them in farms, to distribute services across multiple. And as we see it in, in, in technology for a startup, it's important to scale out, not up. You typically have financial uh, constraints, and it's more important you have to deploy more low-cost servers than increasing, obviously, the capacity, or the, the, uh, capacity of each individual server. But in terms of people, the important thing is to scale up, not out. That means hiring the best people making sure in the intervening process that you know exactly that you have capability and you have, uh, you have uh, a, a team that can, that can take on the challenges and, uh, and uh, apply their minds to the problem. It's better to, to, to be hiring uh, a people you know, that are, um, that can solve, it, it's better to, to hire one person who can take on that problem rather than sort of you know, hiring 20, 30 people and just throwing numbers at the problem. So if we view, uh, as an example, for te in a technology sense, the, the entire process of servicing um, a user on a, on, a, on a social network, we can view it as a production line. So on the left, we have the request is initiated by a user. It traverses a network. It talks to some service, some application servers. That might access a cache, might access a database. This entire production line moves from the left to the right and back again, and the user is serviced with the request. So, if you view each of these as a production line, the important thing here is to take each of these components of the production line, find out exactly what, it, what, cons what constitutes the components of this, and then we can uh, apply problem solving in terms of scaling. So, with the, in terms of the user, the bottleneck, the, uh, well, the, the thing would be to identify the bottleneck at each of these components. With the user, for, well, let's not start with the user, let's start with the network. So on a network, of course, the bottleneck might be packets, it might be uh, your bandwidth, it might be your physical medium. In terms of services, you might be CPU bound. You might have services that are uh, waiting on I.O. It might be that they're not threaded particularly well. That's the service is essentially your bottleneck. When it comes to your caching, RAM, of course, amount of RAM is going to be the problem you have there. If you don't have enough RAM, then the cache is not going to perform optimally. The other thing is your caching algorithms uh, if they are not uh, implemented in the correct way, then of course you're going to be having, having problems in that your cache is not going to be uh, taking the load off your databases on the back end. And that's where we get to the far right hand side where eventually the information 
will probably hit the disk. And here we're going to have problems with uh, slow disks, poor throughput, uh, bad RAID configurations. So, where I said earlier, and you need to understand your entire the the, the entire um, chain, your entire production line. Once you can identify these and put them in the constituent components, you can identify which one is causing the most problem and apply your efforts there. So the solution in this example, of course, would be to, to uh, let's start again start with the network. So in terms of networking, you can improve your physical medium. You can employ load balancing. You can employ network bonding. With your services, you can implement multi-threading. You can improve your threading. You can optimize your code. At the caching level, of course, you can increase your RAM, improve your cache operation. And the database side, where well, we're looking for better RAID configurations, more appropriate RAID configurations, improve, implement uh, write caching, and then, of course, faster disks going to SSDs. The other thing is, of course, on the left-hand side there, which is maybe not often included in, uh, when, it, when it comes to scaling, is that the user, in many respects, can also be scaled in that sense. If you've ever seen uh, perhaps your parents looking at a mobile phone, holding them miles away and tapping the keys, difficult interface, they don't understand it, there's too many options. This needs to also be factored in into scaling. And the way we approach that is with better UX. The experience of the user is, is entirely, uh, or the experience that they will, will have of your service really depends on how they interact with it. You can have a most amazing uh, backend, but if your UI is bad, the user certainly doesn't get that experience. They need to know you need to provide feedback to them. You need to provide to make a, a fast uh, interface. And of course, it means, it means removing a lot of that fluff. If you have things in your application which are not central to the problem you're trying to solve for the user, it's, uh, it's going to be a problem to them. And it'll appear as a slow service, uh, a labored or lumbered service. And for that reason, an approach to scaling on the user uh, here would be better UI and better UX. So in scaling, of course, we find the scaling virtuous circle, which is really problem solving 101. Find the bottleneck, isolate the cause, understand the cause, and implement the fix. And that's pretty much the cycle we go through consistently and apply the scaling virtuous circle to each of the components which I was showing on the previous slides. So solutions to team scaling are, of course, uh, sometimes a little trickier. It's often said that you need to recruit people better than you. It sounds pretty simple, but it's not, it's not at all. I mean, you need to find them and you need to retain them. But the thing is, if you keep hiring smarter people, they'll have better ideas than you. So you, you always want to be doing that. And the only way to be scaling the business up is to be employing, you know, employing people who are going to solve that problem quicker than you can. And you can go on and find new problems and, and scale the team accordingly. For a startup, again, you want to scale up, not out. You have limited resources. You're not able to employ 50 people uh, at once. So you need to make sure you identify the right people. In terms of the team, you need to share knowledge quickly. What we really try to do is facilitate the transfer of knowledge. It's something that we're looking at and improving as we go along. But if everyone has access to that information, if there's no hindrance to that, people can get on with their jobs and they can really grow into the role. They can scale themselves into the role and, and do their work a lot more effectively. Important here is throw people in the deep end because I think the best ones will swim. If you give them the hardest task, they might feel absolutely not able or up to it, they need more time. If you have the right people, they'll take on that challenge and do well. Another thing here is be open to being wrong. <clears throat> Don't take the default stance, you know, it's not my code, it's the handset, it's the network, it's someone else's thing, it's, it's not. Be open to being wrong, be humble about it. If someone comes to you with a problem, Think about it, consider it, take it on. Don't necessarily have a, you know, an attitude which was maybe quite defensive. The other thing there, of course, is if you are hiring people that are better than you, then you're going to be wrong more and more often. So this is sort of the, some of the sharing which we'll do, try to facilitate some of the sessions. Just a quick pick there. So the lessons learned really for us. <clears throat> what, we've, what we've learned is do the difficult things. It, it, it sounds obvious, but easy things are done easily. Everyone's doing easy things. Only do the things that are difficult. Be lean in everything you do. When I was talking about lean earlier, uh, this needs to apply to when it comes to scaling, when it comes to your teams, when it comes to the way that you, that you run the business. Focus on the bottlenecks first. If you're spending time on things which aren't broken, then you're not adding any value. As I said before, 
every effort needs to be expended in the increase of value to your customer. An important thing here, I think, is to just remember that you know before getting uh, maybe religious about the type of language you use, the type of network you use, how the application should be structured, everything has kinks at scale, and that's the important thing. To go in many respects is not, we don't switch out the database when the next newfangled thing comes along. It's Java, it's MySQL, it's Memcache. That's really what we run on. And, you know, opinions come up from time to time, perhaps you should change this and that out. It doesn't matter. Everything will have kinks at scale. It really doesn't matter. Whatever you put in there, whatever newfangled thing, you're going to have a problem. The thing is to understand your problem and, uh, and, and uh, you know, not be tempted maybe to, to change things out for the next new thing. Importantly here, though, is high leverage activities. In everything you do, ask yourself, is what I'm doing at the moment going to have a large effect on the service that you provide? It's more important to do one thing effectively than 10 things which are pretty unimportant. And that means that any problem that you solve will be affecting as many far more users than you know, fixing the small little things which might bug you personally but don't have really effect on the rest of the users. And essentially there, it's about striving for a high power to weight ratio in everything you do. So these are the things which we're still learning, perfectionism. We have a tendency uh, amongst ourselves to, you know, to only put things out if every single kink has been worked out, if every single bug is out of the way. And it's really something, it's, it's, it's a, a uh, it can sometimes really hold you back. The important thing here is, we've all heard this before, release early, release often. Release early and iterate later. Don't worry about it being perfect. Make sure that the app is out there. If you don't have an app out there, no one's using it. If you haven't deployed a service, no one's using it. Don't worry about it being perfect. And this is something we really have to take on board. We have it as a tendency, been only wanting to release you know, a perfect software, a perfect service. Again, high leverage activities, it comes through again. Do things which are gonna have high leverage on your network. Attack those problems first. They're usually, sometimes they're easy, but they're usually the hardest problems. Attack those ones first. It'll have the most impact on your network. And of course, the old uh, added design uh, twice right ones, something I think everyone needs to learn is just think about the problem first before you start tapping on the keyboard. I think that the one other thing is just perhaps be a little bit more risky. Um, one thing that we've definitely learned is just just be a little bit more risk averse. You know, don't don't worry too much about what the the outcomes might be. Put something out there, test it, see what the result is. And I think this is something else which is quite important about a lean approach to things: is put something out, be a little less risk averse. Make sure you can measure it when you deploy it. If you can measure it, then you know the response. If the users like it, it's something good. If they if the, if it, if the you deploy a new monitoring service a new uh, caching service make sure you can measure it when you put it out there you can immediately get feedback and determine exactly whether your efforts are worth it so yes I think that's it that's pretty much what we're still learning um, if anyone's got any questions yeah. Um, so, w uh, what languages are you using on these little Nokia's and things? So it's uh, all Java, J2Me on the on the handset, yeah. And then, how do you download um, the application? Uh, wap to go im. Okay, and these little phones can get it. They absolutely can, yeah. Okay, and, and they don't need to support JavaScript. No, no. Cool. So what happens is um, uh, we pretty much build for for. You know, in, in total, feature phones will, um, the number of phones we support is perhaps more than 800. This is all possible combinations of Nokia's, of Samsung's, and um, you go to the web page, you download it, it's configured for your phone based on the characteristics, the resolution, the keyboard, the uh, capabilities of the phone, and um, which is, this is another thing which, you know, is, is difficult to do. You've got to cater for so many phones, it's not just for an iPhone millions of combinations, runs a Java application, connects to our services and provides the messaging, yeah. That's quite amazing. Do you have like a lot of uh, test phones? We, we, have, a, we, have, a huge, we have a huge safe, um, which seems uh, funny to be storing uh, you know, phones that are 
four or five years old. But the thing is, you know, when someone tells you in Nigeria that a phone doesn't work, you've got to have it on stock. You've got to get it out, give it to QA guys, load the app on, see what it does. Um, there's some pretty bad JVMs out there, and you've got to cater for every kind of, uh, yeah, you know, poor, poor feature phone, yeah. Any more questions? Hi there. Hi. Um, what, 2007, the uh, mixit was quite big. How did to go? Why did to go come about? What's uh, the difference? So, <clears throat> the difference at the time was well, just to give the, the history. Um, Ashley and Alan were, were at Varsity, and they were, uh, you know, they were experimenting with phones. They they created an application that allowed students to share timetables and where the next touch was, uh, because you know they didn't know where they had to be next. And they saw, saw from that pretty much people wanted to message each other. And um, this was independent of Mixit, really. Uh, you know, friends were starting to download it, then this entire CS uh, class was, was using it, sharing timetable information, where the tuck was, you know, in, in a forum base. And they said, well, look, let's, let's approach this properly. Let's approach it as an app that seems people want to message. You know, cost of SMS were particularly high at the time, not a very nice interface either. So let's make an application and, and uh, you know, give people messaging over, over data. Um, what drove your growth in Nigeria, do you think? We did a little bit of promotion in Nigeria at the time. We, we looked at the continents and said, look, where is the growth happening? Um, you know, to set this in context, Africa is, the, the, the cell phone penetration rate is pretty low. There's full saturation in, in Europe, in North America, in South Africa, indeed there is as well. The growth was massive, and we looked at the continents and said, look, you know, feature phones are not going to be around forever. Um, they're certainly not in, in Europe and North America. So, you know, where's this growth happening? And we targeted a few countries in, in Nigeria with simple, simple advertising, web advertising. And I think, you know, Nigeria, again, was a perfect storm. It was, it's a growing population. It's a growing economic power. Um, cell phone penetration was reasonably high, not too high, but growing at a massive rate, far faster than the rest of its neighbors. And I think in any of our, you know, we've, we've found the Nigerian user base is very gregarious. I mean, they really want to get out there and talk to people. They want to meet new people. So we, we, we looked at Nigeria, and there, were, there was Kenya and, and Ghana as well. And we said, look, let's really understand the, the, the country. Um, let's understand what the users want. We facilitated a chat room environment that allowed, um, uh, that was personal to Nigeria. When you're logged in as a Nigerian user, you get a list of the provinces, you get a list of the universities in your area. So people uh, could uh, sort of uh, congregate in, in chat rooms that were very specific. It wasn't you know, like downloading an app and it doesn't have any relevance to you. It's not even in your language. So we focused a lot of effort on making sure that we provided uh, an environment when you got into the application that was particular to Nigerians, or Ghanaians, or Kenyans, or South Africans indeed. And I think that was it, because the service felt familiar when, when they got into it. And I think that was what I was speaking about when it came to the, to the UI on the handset. You can build this amazing backend. And you know, if the user logs in and just sees it means nothing to them, it's difficult to navigate. It's got too much junk in the app. They're never going to use it. So your, your efforts were for naught. Um, hi, sorry. Just with regards to your previous slide, um, you had one point on perfectionism and another point on design twice, write once. Yes. Um, I was just wondering how those two are related with regards to like perf perfectionism, you want to get something out and you want it to reach the user and, and to work. And then you also want to kind of like design things properly and like design it twice and then write it once and deploy it. Well, I think probably the thing there, the way they're related is that it could be seen that designing twice, writing once is perfectionism, but the problem is you'll always find that if if you think the problem out well beforehand, it saves you 10 times on the implementation. When you haven't thought that implementation through, um, you know, you, ha you have a problem. Uh, you suddenly find a weird corner case that means you have to change everything, all of the, the um, notions you've had up until, for development up until that time. So I think the, 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 re the, the reluctance to get too attached to the perfectionism would come through in the designing as well. So that would be to look at it and say, right, do we really need this feature? Is it absolutely essential that this goes in at this time? Let's design it 
with a view to actually getting it executed. And when you do that, it cuts down your, your development time, and it means that when you do finally deploy it, you're able to do so quicker. It might not have every bell and whistle in there, but at least you've got it out there, um, and you get the time saving as well with designing twice. Besides unit testing, do you have any other testing, <coughs> sorry, um, like checking out your servers are still running in different countries or test case or anything like that besides the actual phone testing? In terms of the servers, yep. yes. we do, um, we, monitor, we monitor everything and, uh, and this has been something which this has been a weakness of ours in the past which we've tried to uh, attack aggressively in the, in the recent while is to monitor every aspect of the service, every single point, every tiny little thing is monitored. You know, IOPS of network cards, interrupt status, the lot, the entire stack. But of course, um, we operate in a difficult market. This is, you know, unstable networks a across the continent, uh, poor handset support, poor JVMs. It is very difficult to test these things. I'll say this though, when you have this many users, when things break, you hear about it pretty quickly from all angles. I mean, I'm sure Neil can attest. You know, you change something on Facebook and the entire thing, there's groups being formed and, you know, uh, you know burning effigies outside your house. So we, we hear about it pretty quickly from our users anyway. And that's not to say that that's ideal. You want to know about these things beforehand. Um, so, look, I think everyone in this room is faced with the monitoring challenge. You know, it's so difficult. And it's actually, it, it's, it's a very difficult problem to check your service from all possible aspects. There's, of course, third parties, there's pingdoms of the world that can test things from the outside, from the customer point of view. But it's, um, the, the important thing is measure exactly what you can at, at every possible aspect. And not because you know why you're measuring it today. Sometimes it's better to measure because you don't know. In a week's time, you might have a problem and it really helps having that trend data. You know, when you, when you think something's wrong, uh, you have no trend for it, it's very difficult to tell whether it's wrong or not. But yeah, the networks is a problem because we, 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 we try to we, we try work with a lot of people in the countries that give us feedback quite quickly, but um, yeah, it's a significant challenge for us. Hi, Peter. Hi. You, you guys have a pretty strong footprint in Africa, which I think is different from most startups. Yep. I'd like to hear what you guys had to do specifically to scale in Africa. Like, did you have to build a send bulk message for Nigeria, like, or a spam button? How did you guys, any design decisions or things you had to do to scale specifically in a darker infrastructure that may not be, have the same uptime we enjoy? From the, well, I mean, the general answer, I suppose, is, you know, when it comes to the application, we didn't, we don't spam users, we don't, we don't, yeah, no, no, we, we don't spam users. We don't send out SMSs and say, hey, do you know about this new service? Everything is user generated. Um, we've never gone ahead and, and just, you know, marketed a blanket amount of people and, uh, and, you know, in order to pick up users. In doing that, the, the important thing is to understand the, the nature of a social network. It, it's social. It's you want your friends on that network. Either that or you want to meet new friends of the network who might be you know, you get into the dating aspects of things where they might have certain interests or, or you, want to, you want to talk to people with um, looking for the same thing maybe. The important thing there is build it into your app. It must be immediately obvious how to invite your friends. It must not be difficult. You mustn't have to think about it. We pay for the SMSs on the user's behalf. They don't pay for the invite. We do that. We've built that into the cost of the network. We've made sure that it's easy for people to invite each other. If, you, if a, someone wants to invite 50 friends, then let them. You don't want to make them pay for those, for those SMSs. It comes at a significant cost for us, but it ensures the quality of the network. So the thing there was to build in, build, understand the virality of a social network and build that virality into the app. If you're not doing that, then you're not going to have it working. So, um, I mean, that, that takes care of it from the, from the user side. I think, um, I think your question was around some of the working, is, it's a bit harder there. I mean, look, our infrastructure is all hosted in South Africa. Um, there, are, there are significant problems that might be obvious to say, well, look, put a, put a data center perhaps in Nigeria, the majority of your users are there. The problem is with the data being so hot, you can't distribute that easily. For It might be fine on a feed basis, but on a messaging basis, you, the, the data is so hot to replicate it between two sites is, is extremely difficult. And then, of course, the next thing might be to say, well, look, move your infrastructure there. The problem is, you know, you, you move it wherever you're, the next country pops up, you know, um, might be Vietnam or Indonesia or something, so. 
We're just going to take one last question and then take a. Take I'll say a one break. thing on that note is, is is as what I found is as South Africans we're quite resilient by nature. I think we've grown up in quite a crazy environment where you expect things, electricity to go out next week or this to fail. And I think it's actually built into us the way we built our systems. We don't take anything for granted. We, we anticipate that there might be additional problems, which is why there's so many international recruiters here. Um, so you mentioned localization um, in terms of, of networking. Um, what you didn't mention is language localization, and I noticed that South Africa, Kenya, and Nigeria are all English-speaking countries. Correct. Uh, well, English, so-called English-speaking countries. Yes. Um, but nevertheless, most people there aren't actually speaking English as their first language. No, they're not. And uh, so, are you, would you consider uh, language localization in Swahili and Lingala, and also French and Portuguese? Yes. Okay, so the very interesting thing to this is, what we did in the beginning was when we signed up users, we actually asked them to nominate their language, and we have localization built in. If you're from, uh, if you register in a certain country, we understand the provinces, we understand the languages. The tricky bit is try to get someone to nominate something other than English. It's actually surprisingly difficult. And I, I think this comes from the belief that when you're registering users and you ask them for their language, they believe that the app will suddenly transform into, you know, whatever it might be, Swahili or, or French or Portuguese. And no matter how we phrase that question, what is your home language? What language do you like the most? It'll come up as English, always. I mean, Nigeria has 23 different languages, I think. You know, South Africa, we have the same thing. We have a very tiny proportion of users who will actually nominate something other than English. Now, that, the, only, uh, the only difference, I think, there is that um, this applies to Anglophile countries. However, if you're talking about expanding to South America, you're not going to get very far with English only. The tricky thing is that we've had enough problems just with English-speaking users, and we certainly would like to localize, and we do indeed plan to localize for, on the continent, French and Portuguese is incredibly important. But, you know, we, it's like bits at a time. We, things are pretty big just with English. Cool. Thanks for the questions, guys, and uh, thanks, Peter. <laughs>